Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together, Rob Kowski. Thank you, Angus. It was great. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I hope more than anything that you're going to enjoy my little presentation here this morning after that lovely introduction. I thought it was only Ray McCauley who spoke from on high, but here we are. You know, I was on a stage recently talking to a group of school kids, and uh, I stamped, and my foot went right through the stage. And friends in England said, don't worry about Rob, it's just a stage he's going through. So this one at Nampo is clearly built for free state farmers. It feels far more secure. It's a treat to be here. It really is. And I hope more than anything that you're going to enjoy my story this morning, talking about a remarkable explorer and human being called Ernest Henry Shackleton. I presented this talk earlier this year, and Fricky Maria heard it and felt it might be appropriate for some thought provocation amongst farmers today. So I thank Fricky for the invitation to be here. It's a real treat indeed. Now, before we begin, it would be fair to say that Antarctica is the highest, driest, coldest, windiest continent on Earth. It's an awesome place. The polar plateau on which the South Pole is situated is 10,000 feet above sea level. There are mountains there that rise up to 15,000 feet above sea level, 5,000 feet higher than the top of the Drakensberg. There's ice in Antarctica, four kilometers deep. And from the closest continental edge to the South Pole is a distance of about 850 miles, 1,400 kilometers it's a long, long way, and that edge of Antarctica is closest to New Zealand. For those of you interested in Antarctica, when you look at the maps, you will see a shape of Antarctica. That is what we call the summer extent, because in the winter it doubles in size in terms of pack ice and sea ice, and then wind and current breaks up the ice and it reduces to the size and the shape that you are probably all far more familiar with. Now, the man we're going to talk about this morning, Ernest Henry Shackleton, is a very, very interesting fellow. He was born in Yorkshire. His father was a Yorkshireman, a Quaker, and a doctor. His mother was Irish Protestant. Eight children, five daughters, three sons. He spent his early life in Ireland, and then his father, wanting better financial opportunities, moved the family to London where Shackleton attended Dulwich College. And do you know when he was invited back as an explorer to hand out the academic prizes, he said it was the closest he'd been to the academic prizes of Dulwich. Indeed, he was not known for his scholastic skills. He left school at 16 and joined the Merchant Navy, which is a pretty tough introduction for a young man. Well, he obviously did well in the Merchant Navy, because he was invited to go down on Robert Falcon Scott's expedition to Antarctica in 1901 on board of a ship called the Discovery. And I make this point, and I hope I'm going to make it clearly during the course of my story this morning, that so many of us imagine famous people, famous for whatever reason, suddenly stumbling upon fame. They don't. It's a process. I was listening earlier very carefully to the idea of building a business to last. You know, Malcolm Gladwell in The Tipping Point talks about 10,000 hours. People think the Beatles were suddenly an overnight success. The Beatles used to play two eight-hour sessions out of 24 hours in a German nightclub long before they were well known as a band and for their success. Shackleton's Antarctic career began long before the expedition we are going to concentrate on today called the Endurance Expedition. But he was from the Merchant Navy, far more egalitarian, far more one of the boys. He didn't come from a Royal Navy background like Scott, where everything is delineated and structured and class and rank is particularly important. Do you know that Scott had the ship, 
and his hut divided with a line of packing cases that the officers ate and slept on one side of that line and the others ate and slept on the other side of that line. Now, when you're creating a small team in these dreadfully inhospitable environments, I don't think that's a good way really to foster good teamwork or leadership. And do you know on that trip, Scott chose two men to join him, pulling a sled towards the South Pole. And the two men were going to be Ernest Shackleton and a doctor from Cheltenham in Gloucestershire called Edward Wilson. And they were going to manhaul. I don't know how many of you fine folk have ever considered the term manhauling or know anything about it. Manhauling is when you are joined together in traces to a sled. And you pull a sled in unison where all of your movements have to be totally synchronistic. When you stop, the ice runners freeze to the ice and you've got to jerk in unison to get it moving and keep going. As a result, the men, when they were hauling a sledge, would hardly stop for food or liquid intake. As a result, they spend most of their time dehydrated. Tim Noakes reckons to manhaul a sled in Antarctica, given the conditions and the cold, requires between eight and 10,000 calories of nutrition per day. You want to try and take that in? Were you eating butter and chocolate and cheese and nuts, literally by the handful, trying to get in eight to 10,000 calories of nutrition? Well, do you know on that journey, 850 miles between the hut and the pole, they didn't even make 400 miles. They hadn't made it to the base of the Transantarctic Mountains when scurvy set in, created by a shortage of vitamin C. Shackleton was so badly affected that eventually he had to be pulled on the sled to get him back to the hut. The relationship between him and Scott had broken down completely. And I always say it's important to learn from our mistakes and the mistakes of others. Shackleton was not of the leadership example that Scott was. He wanted to be far more egalitarian and have one team. And Scott sent Shackleton home saying, if he did not return home as an invalid, he would return home in disgrace. And I always think that we need to be very aware of what we say about one another. You know, in an age of instant communication, you can often rue, you can regret a comment made on the spur of the moment. Shackleton and Scott never enjoyed a major expedition together again. Now Shackleton, I think wanting to prove that he was the great explorer, the greater man, he set about raising money for his own expedition to Antarctica in 1907 on board of a little ship called the Nimrod. And he was going to try some very, very unusual cavalier unorthodox methods. He was going to use petrol engine motor sledges with caterpillar-like tracks to pull heavy loads out onto the ice. He was going to use Siberian ponies, dogs, and then manhauling. The British have this obsession with manhauling. They feel there's something vainglorious about getting all the way to the pole under manpower alone. The Scandinavians said, dogs, dogs, dogs. Because a good cross-country skier and a team of dogs travel at about the same pace. And when the dogs run out of steam, you can feed them to the other dogs and to the men. Meat served rare provides large amounts of vitamin C. So you've got fresh meat and vitamin C literally on the hoof or on the foot. And you consume those dogs as you need to as you proceed. For the British, that was complete anathema. Well, would you believe on that trip, building up his experience as a leader and as an explorer with some remarkable staff or crew, they found a way up the Beardmore Glacier. That glacier climbs from 2,000 to 10,000 feet above sea level in 120 miles, 200 kilometers. There's ice on it, literally hard as steel. And in the ascent of that glacier, a horse pulling a sled holding most of the men's food fell into a crevasse, pulling the outer glove off the hand of Frank Wilde, who was leading it. Wilde was left on the ice, but the horse and the sled were gone. So much so 
that from that point forward, Shackleton's men had to augment their rations with horse food trying to survive. Not good on a polar journey. And you know, they got up onto the polar plateau 10,000 feet above sea level and proceeded towards the pole. When Shackleton realized they did not have enough food for obvious reasons to get all the way to the pole and back. So they set up a little camp and they rushed forward with emergency gear, no sled, no tent, to plant the Union flag within 100 miles of the pole. 850 miles? They were within 100 miles of the pole, 97 to be exact, on the 9th of January 1909. I bet they felt they could have spat to the pole. Shackleton later wrote to his wife, Emily Dorman, that he figured she would prefer a live donkey to a dead lion. And you know, they made their way back alive. Shackleton was knighted for his efforts. He always acknowledged the role that Marshall, Wild, and Adams had played in that remarkable journey further south. He lectured all over Britain, Europe, and America. He became the darling of the British public. And because he'd shown it was possible to get to the pole, he probably would have made it had they not lost the sled holding most of the men's food. There were now four nations going to race for the pole, and dare I say it, coming in from the left field, which the British felt just wasn't cricket were the Norskis with their dogs. Now, I don't have the time today, and it's not my intention to describe and explain the race to the South Pole. It was won by Roald Amundsen, a Norwegian, who got there at 3 p.m. on the 14th of December, 1911. A man who started with four companions, four sleds, and 52 dogs. A man who would return with four companions, one sled, and seven dogs. The other 45 had been consumed along the way. Scott stumbled in on the pole 34 days later on the 17th of January of 1912. And at the pole was standing a bamboo rod on which fluttered the Norwegian flag. A black silken emergency tent, an upturned sled, Dog tracks everywhere. And Scott wrote, great God, this is an awful place. And they have reached it without the reward of priority. All the daydreams must go now. His footnote reads, can we do it? 850 miles lay ahead of them back to the hut. Do you know that authors suggest that Scott and his men died psychologically in the moment they realized they'd been beaten to the pole. Not one of the five made it back alive. Not one of the five. So for this man, Ernest Shackleton, sitting in the wings, wondering what is the next great geographic prize left for humankind. He decides, remember he's cavalier, he's unorthodox, he lives life like a rushing wind, persuasive, charming man. He decides it's going to be a crossing of Antarctica. From the western side to the eastern side by the South Pole. This would require two ships, two crews. One to go to New Zealand and set up a food and fuel depot in the Ross Sea and then set up food and fuel stations all the way out across the ice to the South Pole. The other party would come from the far side, from the Weddell Sea on the South American side. Set up a base, take off with dogs and manhauling across the ice, pick up the food and fuel positions, and hopefully exit via the Ross Sea. I'm making this sound fairly simple and straightforward. It wasn't really, but that in essence is what they wanted to do. 1,800 miles, 3,000 kilometers, much of it uncharted. I can't do this talk in Afrikaans. And how many of you folks know that this fellow introduced me had a major health issue quite recently where he ended up in hospital in ICU. And when he was able to speak, I contacted him and I said, hey, Angus, what happened? He said, no, Rob, one of the dash lights came on. So next time you have a major issue with health, 
I want you to consider explaining it away by saying one of the dash lights came on. Well, I'm so glad that you're in good shape again, Angus. I really am. But isn't it interesting to note now that Shackleton buys two ships, one called the Aurora, the other called the Polaris. The Polaris was built in 1912 in the Fromness shipping yard in Sandefjord in Norway, one of the finest ice strengthened vessels of its sort at the time. It had four foot square oak beams crisscrossing the keel to stop it being crushed and squashed by ice. She was built for an operation planning to take tourists to see polar bears and such in the Arctic, and that operation went bankrupt, and Shackleton was able to buy that ship. Probably the finest ice-strengthened wooden vessel of its sort at the time, roughly 400 tons dry weight. Now, Shackleton said, if you want an unusual team, you need unusual interview methods. So he would get a physicist into his office, and he'd say, can you sing? Well, the physicist was intrigued. He said, mm, I can shout along a little in the bath. Because Shackleton placed enormous importance upon his men. He was not threatened by station, experience, qualification, background. He considered loyalty, cheerfulness, optimism, and human fortitude as the greatest characteristics he wanted in a team of men to work well together. He said, your second in command is always your most important hire. Perhaps that's important when you're considering secession in farming. But Shackleton put together the most unusual group of men for this expedition, not based on their experience, their qualification, or their background, based on whether he thought they would be able to work together well if the chips were down. Now, in 1914, in the last quarter, the worst conflict our people will ever know broke out in terms of the First World War. So Shackleton offered his men and his ships to the war effort, and he got a typically Churchillian reply from First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Spencer Churchill, and the reply read, proceed. Now, Churchill is an interesting individual. You know, he'd been with the 17th Lancers at Omdurman in the Kareri Hills on the 2nd of September of 1898, fighting the dervishes, the Ansari of the old Mahdi, now being led by the Khalifa in the Sudan. Those men were brave. Do you know that they would lie down in little depressions in the ground and let charging horses gallop over them? And then they'd leap up and cut their hamstrings. And as the horse went down, they'd deal with the riders. Well, Churchill was unsettled that way. He managed to fight his way clear with a revolver, find a rideable horse, and live to breathe another day. The following year, he came out to this country as a reporter with the Morning Post and a young officer with a South African light horse. And it nearly all went horribly wrong for him. And I wonder whether the warning from his mother was stuck in his mind, because his mother was concerned about his safety. And he said, Mother, have no fear. The gods would never have created so potent a being as myself for so prosaic an ending as to be killed by a Boer Mauser bullet. Well, do you know the Boers captured him on the armored train between Escort and Colenso on the 15th of November of 1899. And the driver of the train had smashed his head badly when the train was derailed, when the Boers had put rocks on the line, blood pouring down his face. And she, Churchill gave him a slap, told him to stop being hysterical, and said, lightning never strikes the same place twice. Drive the train. And they pushed the derailed carriages off the track, and they're now beginning to chuff with that steam engine back towards Chivli and Escort. And the men who were still on the ground are beginning to run, what I call doing the interflora alongside of the train, trying to get on. Well, Churchill was a bit slow, and the train left him. Now, his white epidermis and his red hair was not suited to that big yellow ball you folks here in the Free State rely upon for good millies. And you know, he looked at his captor who was on a horse. Craig Carter, my dear friend from Natal, knows the family well. And Churchill 
pulled a little notepad out of his pocket and a pencil, and he wrote his name on the piece of paper and the date, and he passed it up to his Boer captor, a man called Goss, and he said, keep this. I'm going to be famous one day. Do you know the Goss family at Mokut still have that piece of paper from 1899? Well, Churchill was lucky enough to survive the Boer War. Now, he tells Shackleton and his men to proceed. So Shackleton has assembled his men. He has prepared his ships. He's got the best equipment that money can buy. And he is now going to send off the Aurora to New Zealand. And he's going to send off the newly named Endurance under his own command to South America. Why am I suddenly talking about Endurance rather than the Polaris? Because Shackleton's family motto was, through endurance we conquer. So he changed the name of Polaris to endurance. And people who sail tell me it's poor form to change the name of a sailing vessel. I know many farmers who consider it bad luck to change the name of a farm. But we're now talking about the endurance on account of that being Shackleton's family motto, through endurance we conquer. Now, you don't need to take particular note of this next photograph, but I just wanted to show you, this is a recent colorized photograph of Shackleton's crew in front of the ship. You can see that their outfits were typically British, silk and cotton close to the body, wool underneath that, a Burberry oil skin on the outside for the Inuit, the Eskimo, and the Scandinavians, they all used animal skins, loosely fitting, with the hair on the inside that the air can move around, nothing freezes close to your body. Now, isn't it wonderful to consider a number of things at this point? The world war's broken out. The Aurora is sent off to New Zealand. Shackleton takes charge of the newly named Endurance and sails down to Buenos Aires in South America. Now, these are seamen. So they all take off into the alehouses, and they have a number of what we... Englishmen call hydraulic sandwiches. And amongst the alehouses, they find a young man from Wales called Perse Blackborough, who decides immediately that he wants to be part of this adventure going to Antarctica. So they hide him in a cupboard for four days until they're sure Shackleton is too far out to take him back. And now Shackleton is presented with this young man. And Shackleton was good at reading people quickly. And he obviously liked the look of this tough brave young Welshman, but he had to give an air of authority and gruffness, and he said, listen, Blackborough, if things go wrong, we eat the stowaway first. Well, do you know that that young, brave Welshman immediately said, sir, they'd get more meat off you, <laughs> and they became great friends, and it's interesting to note that Shackleton had a policy with his crew of what we call able-bodied seamen, we call them ABs, mixing them with their BAs, the folk had degrees. He didn't want any geologist or physicist or doctor to feel that he was superior to the ABs and he'd mix them up doing the same tasks on board of the ship. One team, one crew, one goal. Not that delineated structure as he'd experienced with Scott. Well, when Shackleton got to South America, he picks up the stowaway and they move off to that little pinprick of an island called South Georgia. South Georgia at the time was the headquarters of world whaling, headed up by the Norwegians. And they said that the pack ice that year was the worst in living memory and he was strongly advised to delay his departure and wait for the pack ice to break up or come back the following year. But try and imagine Shackleton, he's got the pressure of the British public and the British press on his back. The First World War has broken out, all the sponsors wanting a result. How could he turn back? So he restocks the ship, and on the 5th of December of 1914, Shackleton takes off with his overloaded ship initially eastwards and then southwards into the Weddell Sea, and a thousand miles north of where it was expected, they come into pack ice. And they're now pushing the overloaden ship down through the pack ice, burning up valuable reserves of fuel. I would like to show you quickly, if I may,
a map just to give you an idea of the story I want to try and share with you because a lot of listeners become very, very confused by the story as it develops. Right at the top center of that image, we have South Georgia. You can see the solid red route of the ship going eastwards and then southwards down into the Weddell Sea. Before I proceed with my story, I want you all to understand that flowing around Antarctica is a current called the Circumpolar Current, the greatest ocean current on Earth, 1,000 times the flow of the Amazon River. And between Antarctica and the Antarctic Peninsula that runs up towards South America in that image called Palmerland, just above that key in the rectangle, creates a huge clockwise gyre of water that moves pack ice and sea ice quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, that pack ice can move at three miles a day, 100 miles a month. Well, Shackleton and his men would get to a point 43 miles from land. If you climb to the crow's nest, you could see land where they planned to establish their base at Bussell Bay. When the wind turned, the temperature plummeted, and the sea froze, trapping their ship like an almond in a slab of chocolate. Let's look at some pictures. Here's the ship caught, beset in the ice. Do you know that two weeks later, a lead developed? A lead is what we call open water, about 400 yards out in front of the ship. And Shackleton and his desperate men tried to cut a channel through to get to that open water with crowbars, pickaxes, and ice saws. Do you know they had with them an Irishman from Anaskolan Island, Tom Crean, and a great block of ice tipped up, trapping him between the ice and the ship with a crowbar between his body and the ship. That crowbar emerged bent. Crean said he was fine. One of the toughest of them all, he becomes a great hero in the story. Well, this was futile. The sea would refreeze and completely trap the ship, and the ship is now beginning to drift off in that clockwise northwesterly direction at a rate of about three miles a day. So Shackleton is going to have to change the entire routine on board, Angus. He's going to have to make the ship a winter station. And to that end, they would put hummocks of ice a mile out from the ship, joined by rope, that the men could exercise the dogs without getting lost or losing themselves. And on board of the ship, on a Saturday night, they had a sing-along with a gramophone. It became one of their most prized possessions was a gramophone. And at the end of the evening, they'd have a toast. And the toast always was, remember, these are tough seamen, to wives and sweethearts, may they never meet. Now, they proceeded with their scientific experiments. You can see the experiments there taking place on the left. I want you to take note of the man on the extreme left carrying a huge block of ice on his shoulder. That's Blackbird of the stowaway. He's carrying an ice to be melted for fresh water. And on the right, two men are playing chess. The one on the left in that image is Frank Hurley. He was an Australian. Do you know that in a former life he'd been a tinsmith? Funny how fate plays its hand. I wonder if Shackleton knew that a tinsmith might be very worthy and useful on board. Because as it turned out, when the ship was crushed by the ice, they salvaged a lot of tin and metal from the ship, and that man, who was now the photographer, made little emergency stoves for them to cook food on the boats and on the ice as the ship was destroyed and finally sunk. And the man next to him on the right is Leonard Hussey, who was a meteorologist and the smallest man in the party. He was also a very good banjo player. And Shackleton knew that music and musical instruments might be important mental medicine as this journey would unfold. Well, how many of you know, living here in the free state, where I know the days can be short and the nights can be long and very cold, that the Antarctic winter is four months of complete darkness? Four months of complete darkness. More people take their lives in these polar winters than just about anywhere else on earth. And in the middle of that winter, Frank Hurley would ask his men to move out onto the ice and set up 36 flashlights to illuminate the ship, 
in this fashion, this is probably one of the most haunting images of the whole expedition. This is the endurance on the 21st of June of 1915, trapped in the ice. Look at the frost and the cold in the rigging. Midwinter shot. Well, when winter turned to spring, millions of tons of ice began to move. For those folks at the back, do you mind me coming down here? All good? I'm finding it quite a small space up there, and I far prefer to be close to the audience, if you don't mind. Do you know that in the spring of 1915, millions of tons of ice began to move? Shackleton, in his book, titled South, does a drawing of the ship with a huge ice flow coming in on the bow, another coming in on the stern, and a third coming in midships, bending that ship like a bow. Well, even for that 400-ton ice-strengthened vessel, it was too much. And on the 17th of October, 1915, the ice pierced the hull, popped the ship out of the ice, and water began to pour in. The men are now obliged to abandon the ship. And Shackleton said to his 2RC and great friend Frank Wild, Wild, what the ice gets, the ice keeps. Look at this shot of Shackleton looking over the side of his stricken ship. But I've said fate always plays its hand. Do you know that these men were given until the 21st of November to evacuate the ship? I make that point because effectively they had five weeks to get supplies, food, lifeboats, tent, reindeer skin sleeping bags, and so forth off the ship before on the 21st of November she finally goes down in what is titled appropriately the end. I want you to imagine 28 men, 57 dogs on the sea ice, and the sea ice is moving all the time because the ocean is heaving underneath it. And you know that beneath you, is three kilometers of water, 3,000 meters of frigid Antarctic water. Well, because they were able to salvage a lot of stuff from the ship, they set themselves up at a camp. Quite interesting that the camp was at this position here. They've drifted 750 miles from where the ship was caught in the ice to the point it was crushed and eventually sank. 750 miles, 1,200 kilometers over 10 months. And now they are living on the ice. They are well prepared. They've got the lifeboats. They've got food. They've got a lot of supplies. Shoal. But this camp very quickly became unhygienic. So they moved the camp about three miles to a big level ice flow where they considered they'd have more stability. And when they moved the camp, they moved two of the three lifeboats that they'd taken off the ship. The ship had three lifeboats that were named after major backers in Britain, the James Cad, the Dudley Docker, and the Stancombe Wills. And the Stancombe Wills were small, and the men considered it to be unseaworthy, so they left it behind at the site of the ship sinking. Now, this is a wonderful, wonderful part of the story. It sounds like the story of the Franks, because Shackleton's second in command, most important hire, was a man called Frank Wilde. Do you know he died in this country as an alcoholic in 1939? In South Africa, yes, Clarksdorp. The ship's captain was a man called Frank Worsley, who came from New Zealand. He had an uncanny ability with navigation. And when he arrived for the interview, he said he'd walked down Burlington Street imagining that icebergs were sailing alongside of him. And Shackleton liked him and employed him pretty much immediately. But he is crucial to the survival of the men because he had an uncanny ability with navigation. Frank Worsley. I've mentioned Frank Hurley. You know, we love playing the Australians at any sport and hopefully beating them. They tend to be opinionated. They tend to be outspoken. And we need big Buddha like you to take care of them. But they called him the prince on account of his opinionated manner. And he liked to be involved in all major decisions. So Frank Wilde, Frank Worsley, and Frank Hurley held a consultation. And they realized that if the 28 men were forced into the lifeboats, the two 
were not enough. They needed the third. So they went back for the Stancombe Wills, and in recovering it, they recovered Leonard Hussey's banjo. And he said, what on earth is this for? And Shackleton said, that is going to be mental medicine. Do you know that they would move forward to this camp where they've recovered quite a lot of timber from the ship? And I hope you take note of that tower at the back with somebody standing on it. Because you probably are unaware that these men are living on rations that comprise largely of what we call pemmican. This is desiccated beef with fat that is then fortified with other foods, chocolate, cocoa, tea, and so forth. Fresh meat is a huge plus. Remember the scurvy? If you could shoot seals, they make a wonderful addition to your diet. But I don't know how many of you are aware that seals and walruses, for obvious reasons, when they come out of the water onto the ice, they wait right at the ice edge. That if there's any threat, they can go straight into the water. And if you shoot them and don't kill them instantaneously, they go into the water and are gone, lost to you. Now, Frank Wilde, the second in command, was a very good shot. And they had someone during light hours up on that platform looking for seals. And then they dispatch Frank Wilde with others to hopefully shoot the seal, avoid it getting into the water, and bring the fresh meat back for the men. Trying to imagine what a joy that was to the addition on the ship. They talk about fortifying the soup with blood. That might sound horrific to us. Let me tell you, for these men, that was a godsend. Now, Shackleton knew that idle bodies and idle minds are a very dangerous combination. He had to give his men the impression that they were doing all they could to try and achieve their own salvation. And to do that, they were going to load the sleds with a lifeboat. And then into the lifeboat, they were going to pack food, equipment, tents, reindeer skin sleeping bags, and try and pull them out in a northwesterly direction to get to open water. Do you know that those boats fully loaded weighed probably 3,000 pounds, about 1,400 kilograms, heavier than one of your buckies. And as a result, they generally crushed the sleds. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of a term called catabatic winds. Cold air sinks. And cold air from the polar plateau comes down to the ocean on all sides as catabatic winds, flowing sometimes at 200 miles an hour, 320 kilometers, blowing ice and snow ahead of it, creating what are called ice ridges, what we call sastrugi. They have a windward side and a leeward side. They can be as close together as 50 yards. And I want you to try and imagine doing this. This is man hauling. Were you trying to pull a loaded boat on sleds across the ice, cutting and turn a channel through each ice ridge? The men made the point that 17 men could not pull as powerfully as 14 dogs. Bearing in mind they've come through the winter, they've had very little exercise and very little nutrition. They're pretty soft and flaccid. 14 dogs pulled more strongly than 17 men. It was hopeless, Shaw. They settled down at a camp that was to become known as Patience Camp. Patience Camp was a difficult place. Shackleton had to carefully select the crew for each tent. Some difficult individuals with more easygoing individuals and a reasonable tent captain. He'd send Leonard Hussey around with his banjo to lead the men singing seaman shanties, trying to maintain morale. And Shackleton always said that leadership has many penalties. And one of the greatest is that of loneliness. Where you have to make very difficult decisions and then give your men time to grow accustomed to those decisions. Shackleton decided that the dogs were requiring too much care, food, and attention. Now, we know how the British feel about their dogs. Many of these dogs have had puppies. And each team leader had to go around a hummock of ice and Frank Wilde was given the awful task of shooting the dogs. With the dogs went a cat. There was a carpenter on board of the ship called Henry Chippy McNish from Scotland. 
Isn't it wonderful? I see some of you smiling how the British always call a carpenter chippy. And he had a tabbing top cat with him that was called Mrs. Chippy. And Shackleton said, because the dogs have to go, the cat has to go too. Well, Chippy went berserk. Sadly, he suffered very badly from hemorrhoids, piles. This is often the function of cold, poor hygiene, and the diet. It can make you rather grumpy. And when his cat was destroyed, he went berserk. He considered himself an expert in maritime law. And he said, since the ship was gone, they were no longer under Shackleton's command. And he tried to orchestrate a mutiny. And Shackleton had to pull out a contract that each man had signed back in Britain, stating that they were under his command, whether at sea or on land, until returned to a safe port. But he said, in this time of stress and strain, I could have shot McNeish. There's a telling photograph taken by Frank Hurley with a little Kodak vest pocket camera of Shackleton sitting on a pallet, writing his journal, and next to him is the shotgun prominently displayed. In this time of stress and strain, I could have shot McNeish. So Shackleton decides now, with morale at an all-time low and a potential mutiny, that they have to make an attempt to move forward again. And to do so, each man is going to pare down his personal possessions to two pounds. So the men go off on the ice and cut a hole and deposit gold coins, a plated family photograph, perhaps a locket off a neck. And a man who was a bully and a bosun, a good wrestler, a man of little education called John Vincent, found within himself, would you believe, the gall to go from hole to hole and steal what he thought he could sell later. And he sewed those items into little pockets on his jacket. A secret like that is a difficult thing to keep in Antarctica. And I think that Shackleton was a very generous spirited man. But would you believe he denied McNish and Vincent the polar medal for the mutiny, the theft, and their subsequent behavior? Their families still live with a slight, but Shackleton and polar authorities will not budge that given the circumstances, these two did not deserve the polar medal. Now, as the story unfolds, we come to a position where the ice is beginning to break up. Can I give you a time frame again before we go on, ladies and gentlemen? 5 December 1914, they leave South Georgia. 17 January 1915, they're trapped in the ice. The ship eventually sinks almost 11 months later on the 21st of November of 1915. These men have been on the heaving ice for six months to April of 1916 when the ice begins to break up. Now, you might think that that is an advantage. Their little lifeboats were wooden and run the continual risk of being crushed by ice. So if you have to paddle in open water, you run the continual risk of being crushed by ice. I go to Antarctica often. I want to tell you the speed that ice moves is frightening. So then you've got to pull your boat out onto the ice, across the ice, and back into the water. Backbreaking work. Do you know at times these men would wear six to nine pairs of socks trying to keep their feet dry and warm? And eventually the ice breaks up to the point that they paddle for 108 hours, four and a half days and nights without a warm drink or meal, sucking ice to slake their thirst. At one point on that desperate, desperate row, the Stancombe Wills disappeared with their crew for 12 hours. Shackleton thought they were lost forever. Remarkably, they were reunited, and Shackleton immediately insisted that that boat be tied to his, the James Cad, with a rope that had not happened again. And would you believe, at the end of April of 1916, Angus, they fetch up on this rocky, inhospitable piece of land called Cape Valentine on Elephant Island. The island at the back is Cornwallis Island. This is a dreadful place. When we talk about beaches, don't think of our beaches. These are basically steep, rocky spits or promontories. And they decide the first man who should be out on land after 17 months at sea and on the ice. 
is the little stowaway from Wales, Blackborough. And they lift him out of the boat to make his way up the beach. He collapses. He's got frostbitten feet. Look at this photograph of the men pulling the boats up onto the beach, exhausted as they were. Do you see a little figure sitting there on a rock? Do you see the little figure? That's Perse Blackborough, who can't stand because of his frostbitten feet. And if you're interested in the story, read the account of the surgeon called Alexander Macklin. As they turn two boats upside down, try and make what we would call a shelter, and warm it up with fire to try and get it to 20 degrees. They then boil the instruments to clean them, and then they try to anesthetize Blackborough with chloroform dripping into a cloth over his nose. Too much chloroform, and you stop the heart and the lungs. Too little, and the pain is unbelievable. Read the sound that those toes make as they are cut off and they drop into a little enamel bowl. They say frostbite doesn't hurt until it starts to defrost. Look at this picture, a recently colorized one, of the men having their first warm drink in five days, ladies and gentlemen. First warm drink in five days. Look at Shackleton there with a cigarette in his left hand and some hot chocolate in his right and the desperation of the men. But that beach was not safe. So Shackleton sent the men he trusted most, Worsley, Wilde, Crean, McCarthy, around to check out the northern side of the island to find a place for the men to camp. They found a little spit of land that has been forever since known as Point Wild. Do you know that Point Wild, ladies and gentlemen, is less than a quarter the size of this beautiful room? Behind you is a huge cliff. Back over your left shoulder is a massive glacier pouring frigid air onto that site 24-7. In front of you is the wildest ocean known to man, the Southern Ocean. The point I'm making, if you want a moment alone or you want to go for a walk, there's no option. And Shackleton said that as the options narrow, you have to go for broke. There was now a second Antarctic winter coming. So he decided that he was going to leave 21 men in the hand of Frank Wilde, his second in command, on Point Wilde, whilst he was going to take five men and try and sail the James Cad to South Georgia to get help. Now, this is the structure that they made at Point Wilde. Two upturned boats mounted on lines of rock and ice with a little skirting of canvas. They put in a chimney to try and get rid of the bad air. Because when you burn penguin and seal blubber, it creates a black, acrid, oily covering that covered the men from head to toe to the point that they weren't recognizable until you got right up to one another. They all looked like homogenous chimney sweeps. And Shackleton was going to prepare the James Card for a journey using the wind and the current to try and get back to South Georgia to get help from the whalers. Now what is intriguing about this little boat is that they lifted the gunnels by 18 inches from that white line to its present height. They put on a second mast from the Dudley Docker. They covered it with canvas and timber that it'd be less likely to be swamped and loaded a ton and a half of ballast, sewn together in old blanket bags in the base of that little boat to give it some ballast and some weight. Now, what I find intriguing about all this is that Shackleton said to the mutineer, Chippy McNish, McNish, this is what I need you to do. You've got to lift the gunnels 18 inches, cover it with canvas and timber, put on a second mast, reinforce the tiller, the rudder, put in a ton and a half of ballast, and you, McNish, are coming with us. Fine way to motivate a mutineer. He'd take with him the thief, John Vincent, wasn't going to leave McNish or Vincent with the younger men on Elephant Island to create discord and discontent for Frank Wilde. Interesting lesson in that too, keeping your enemies or your discontents close to you. How many of us love the idea of putting difficult staff in the hand of someone else? Work with those we find easy to work with. Not Shackleton. 
The other three men he took are intriguing. The first was the ship captain, Frank Worsley, because of his ability with navigation. The second was that tough man from Honest Call, Tom Crean. Remember the crowbar? The third was a man called McCarthy, who came from the Hebrides, who learned to row and sail as soon as he learned to walk. And Shackleton knew that if it came down to tin tacks, they needed his incredible, incredible seamanship on board of that little boat. Do you know he said to Frank Wilde, if I'm not back in three months, Wilde, you consider us dead and make the best plan you can for the men. Do you know that the men on Elephant Island left living under that little shelter, eating emergency rations and what remnants they could of the seals and the penguins? I don't know how many of you are aware that the seals and the penguins are entirely dependent on the pack ice. So when winter comes and Antarctica doubles in size with the ice, the penguins and the seals move out with it. They can't feed and they can't breathe beneath solid ice. As a result for these men, there were no penguins or seals left to harvest. Do you know in the end they would be eating seaweed and kelp trying to survive? Well, on this journey, on day 11, Shackleton sees what he thinks is the light of a coming day and land in front of him. And he looked again and realized it wasn't land, it was an almighty wave. And he shouted at the men, hold on, here she comes. And that great wave crashed over that little boat, practically sinking it. They bail water for hours until their boat once again begins to behave like a boat. And at that point, they opened the last can of fresh water they'd loaded on Elephant Island to find it had been stoven on a rock and filled with brackish seawater. So they're now back to sucking ice to slake their thirst. Do you know that on this journey of 14 days to cover 1,200 kilometers to South Georgia, they saw the sun on three occasions? Three occasions where Frank Worsley is clinging to the mast. He's being supported by two men, and he's trying to rest on his knees on the deck, trying to get a reading with a sextant between the heaving horizon and the sun knowing that if they missed that pinprick of an island by three miles east or west, the wind and the current would preclude them getting back to the island, and they would have died somewhere between there and Cape Town. They all said, Shoal, that they couldn't have made it without divine intervention. But when they got to South Georgia on day 14 of this incredible journey, the wind and the current precluded them taking the chance of sailing through a gap into King Hakon Sound. So they tacked for 36 hours in front of that entrance, waiting for the wind to abate, but it never did. Eventually they said, we're going to die against the cliffs, or we're going to die of thirst. We'll take our chances with the cliffs. And they crashed through that entrance into the sound, landed on a rocky little beach where a glacial stream slaked their desperate thirst. But they were so thirsty, they drank and drank and drank. When you're very thirsty, it's the worst thing to do. They were sick, had a drink again. And then they try, weakened as they were, to pull their little boat up the beach using three rollers of oars. And in doing so, broke two of their three oars. And at that point, Tom Crean incidentally walked around the back of the James Card to notice that the tiller, the rudder was gone, making her worthless for any further open water work. So they moved their little boat up the sound to a camp they called Peggotty Camp, where a cave gave them some shelter. But most importantly, near that cave was a nesting colony of wandering albatrosses. You know, the wandering albatross is the greatest wingspan on earth, more than 10 feet, over three meters. They live for 80 years, they pair for life, and they've got a head basically as large as a human being's. And their chicks stress out at about nine pounds. For these emaciated men, they said the meat was so good, we even ate the bones. Isn't it intriguing to consider that as Crean walked one day down the beach, in all of the Southern Ocean, the sea had deposited their lost rudder back on the beach close to Peggotty Camp. 
But Shackleton had already made his decision that Vincent and Magnish, the two troublemakers, said they were too weak to go any further by land or by water, that he was going to leave them in the cave being fed by McCarthy, whilst he, Worsley, and Crean were going to attempt to walk over the mountains of South Georgia to get help from the whaling station on the other side. It's interesting to note that all the bad weather and wind comes up from Antarctica and buffets the southern side of South Georgia. As a result, the whaling stations are on the northern side of the island. But isn't it wonderful to consider that South Georgia is bisected by a range of mountains called the Aladas Mountain Range. This is one of the most inhospitable mountain ranges on earth. These men have no tent, no sled, no emergency camping gear. They've got an emergency stove made by Hurley. They unscrewed the brass screws out of the James Cad and screwed them through the soles of their boots to give them some traction. And they had 50 feet of climbing rope. Now, I could do a talk probably about this hike or this walk alone because they ended up on crevasses that they couldn't cross and had to find their way around the glacier. They ended up on cliffs that they couldn't ascend and had to find their way around. At one point, they were faced with a snow slope of 3,000 feet, 1,000 meters, and figured that they were so tired they'd take the risk. And they rolled up their 50 feet of climbing rope and got onto it like kids would on a toboggan and took off down that slope. Crean said it was the most stupid thing we did. At times, we were probably traveling at 60 miles an hour, 96 kilometers an hour, and our 22 comrades back on Elephant Island were relying on us for their salvation. Do you know they thought they were at the whaling station valley and they came down the valley all the way to the water to learn that they were in the wrong valley? Shackleton decided that they should have some hot chocolate. Crean and Worsley went to sleep. Shackleton said we were so exhausted and so done in that I knew if we went to sleep, death would follow. He let them sleep for five minutes, waking them, saying they'd been asleep for 30 and they needed to proceed. And at that point, would you believe, at seven o'clock in the morning, they heard the siren from the whaling station in Stromness calling the whalers to work. Do you know as they descend the valley towards Stromness, they faced a waterfall that was icy. They tied their rope at the top. They let Crean down first. He was heaviest, then Shackleton, then Worsley, and they couldn't get the rope to come loose. And when they walked into the whaling station, children bolted from the view of them. Shackleton knew the whaling captain well, and he walked to his home. The whaling captain never recognized him, and Shackleton extended his hand and said, Ernest Shackleton. And that whaling captain, a tough Norwegian, cried. And Shackleton said, is the war over? And the captain said, the war's not over. The world has gone mad, and there are thousands of men dying over the channel in France. Do you know that Shackleton rescued his three men from Pegatee Camp? And as if the story has not held enough misadventure already, he made three attempts to get back to Point Wild, Elephant Island 3. I've been lucky enough to make 13 attempts to get to Point Wild, Elephant Island with expedition ships, and we've made it in on five, five out of 13, because of the pack ice. The pack ice on one occasion stopped him only five miles from the island. Eventually, he borrowed a little ship called the Yelko or the Yelcho from the Chilean government under its captain called Luis Pardo, and promising the Chileans that he wouldn't take their metal-hulled ship near the ice, because ice at that time had a reputation for opening a steel-hulled vessel like a tin opener. Do you know on the 30th of August of 1916, Shackleton got back to Elephant Island? I want you to imagine what it meant for a man who considered loyalty, optimism, cheerfulness, and physical fortitude above any other human characteristic. A man who no doubt prized the lives of his men above that of his own. A man who never criticized them publicly, encouraged friendly competition. He would invite men into his cabin often and say, what books have you read? And then he would encourage from the library another book to read to increase 
that particular seaman's knowledge and discuss it with him until the ship went down. Can you imagine what it meant to Shackleton when he shouted to Wilde and said, Wilde, are you well? And Wilde shouted back, I'm well, sir. We are all well. They hadn't lost a man. 22 black chimney sweeps appear on the beach. This is not a genuine photograph. It's a staged photograph of what that rescue looked like with a little Yelko waiting for the men to be paddled out to the Yelko. Do you know that their return to England was completely overshadowed by what was going on over the channel in France? Do you know that some of these men had the indignity of being spat at in the streets? People saying you were having a jolly down on the ice whilst your comrades are dying in the trenches of France. Two of these men were dead within months in the trenches of France. Now Shackleton and his old friend Frank Wilde had coined a wonderful phrase. Those little white voices keep calling me back. I understand that. I've been going to Antarctica since 2011, a number of times every year. It is one of the most beguiling, mesmerizing places on earth. Those little white voices keep calling me back. Do you know that if you read about polar exploration and you read about the Arctic and you read about the Antarctic, you will read about cannibalism and murder and suicide and madness and post-traumatic stress and mutiny. None of that on this. Do you know that Shackleton asked his old guard, his old friends, to volunteer? He wanted to go back to Antarctica in 1921. He was sponsored by a man called Rowett, a very wealthy British industrialist. He got a ship called the Quest. You will not believe that many of the men who'd been through this extraordinary adventure considered the greatest survival story of the modern age and one of the greatest leadership stories we'll ever know. He said, boss. They loved him. They called him the boss. We'll come. Well, they get back down to South Georgia to Gritviken, and the ship is at anchor, 4th of January, 1922. Shackleton wasn't feeling very well. He had a congenital heart condition. He was an asthmatic. He'd hidden his heart condition from every medical board that ever examined him, but it eventually precluded him going to the trenches. He'd had the issues with scurvy on the discovery, the issues with scurvy, dysentery, and worse, on board of the Nimrod. Then these misadventures, including scurvy, now, he wasn't feeling well, 47 years of age, and he called his doctor, Alexander Macklin, down for a consultation, and Macklin had a chat with him that I've had quite often with my doctor, and it's about cholesterol and exercise, and blood pressure, and diet, and lifestyle. Do you know, I saw my doctor recently, and he said, Rob, I think you need two AFDs a week, and I said, now, what on earth is an AFD? He said, an alcohol-free day. I said, look, you and I have known each other 20 years, and I'm a reasonable guy, but I don't have a nine-day week. <laughs> Nonetheless, do you know that Shackleton never made the dawn? He died in the dawn of the 5th of January of 1922. His men embalmed the body to be sent back to England for burial, and when it got to Buenos Aires, a telegram was sent to his wife, Emily Dorman, and she sent back a response saying, Antarctica always was his mistress, bury him there. So Shackleton was taken back to South Georgia to be buried in the Whalers Cemetery at Gritviken. His gravestone is a huge piece of granite. It turns out to be a footstone, not a headstone, because he wanted to be buried facing Antarctica. And do you know that he loved poetry? He read a great deal of poetry, and he loved a poet called Robert Browning. And on the back of that great stone is a stanza from one of Browning's poems. And those words read, I hold that a man should strive to the uttermost for his life set prize. I've changed that a little. And I say, now I hold that a man or a woman should strive to the uttermost for their life set prize. And in this story, as we've looked at Shackleton's remarkable relationship with his crew and the respect between them, that created perhaps the greatest survival story of the modern age. If you remember one point 
from my little story here today, I pray it be that each and every one of you strive to the uttermost for your life's set prize. Thank you all very much.